Yeah, twice a year, in June and um, January, we we collect the life and teaching of Ajahn Chah, one of the greatest forest monks of the last century. But sometimes we should also recollect the greatest forest monk in history. So, who is the greatest forest monk in history? <laughs> I didn't hear you, sorry. <laughs> But that is in terms of disciples. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Venerable Mahakasapa is the greatest forest monk in history. <laughs> uh, yeah, he he was the greatest disciple of the Buddha after the two chief disciples, Venerable Sariputta and Venerable Mahamogalana. And he was the disciple foremost in ascetic practices. And so he came he became the example of Buddhist forest traditions in the last 2,500 years in this way. Yeah, when when Abhirama Kasapa was still a lay person, his parents arranged a marriage for him with a woman called Pada Kapilani. Even though they both didn't want to get married, they both actually wanted to leave their worldly life behind and become religious seekers. And his wife, Pada Kapilani, she says in her Terigata verses that she and her husband, Markasapa, went forth into homelessness together. So this is something rather unusual that two people, like a married couple, want both to ordain. Usually only the man wants to ordain and the wife stays behind, or the wife wants to ordain and the man stays behind. But in this case, they both had this aspiration and wanted to yeah, devote their life to a spiritual practice. But then once they became Samanas, religious seekers, they went separate ways. It wouldn't have been appropriate that they stay together like husband and wife anymore. And, but after they separated, they both met the Buddha in different ways. So at the end, they both ended up ordaining in the monastic order of the Buddha. And both became great arahants. Venerable Mark Kasapa says that after deciding to leave household life behind, he made a rope from patchwork cloth, from old cloth. And he says he followed the examples of those who are arahants in the world. So he already had this idea on his own that there is something like an ultimate spiritual attainment and people there must be some people there who realize that. When Brahma Kasapa meets the Buddha the first time when he's traveling on the road between Rajagaha and Nalanda, and already the first encounter between the Buddha and Venerable Makasapa shows that he is a very special person. And Venerable Makasapa sees the Buddha sitting at a shrine peacefully, and Venerable Makasapa just sees the Buddha sitting there and he thinks, if I ever see a teacher, then it's then it is this blessed one that I see now. And if I ever see a perfectly enlightened one, then that must be that must be the perfectly enlightened one. So he just sees the Buddha and just sees thinks this is his teacher and this is a perfectly enlightened one. And he just goes to the Buddha and bows to him and says, The blessed one is my teacher and I'm I am his disciple. 
the Blessed One is my teacher and I'm his disciple. So just by seeing the Buddha, he has this complete confidence that this is his teacher and his master and um, a perfectly enlightened one, which is, yeah, usually doesn't occur like this, even with other great disciples of the Buddha. And the Buddha already knows him, he already knows his name, he, he already addresses him as Kasapa, even though they never um, communicated before. And so after when Mark Kasapa bows to the Buddha, the, the Buddha says, Kasapa, if one who doesn't know and see would say to a disciple who is so determined like you, I know and see, then his head would split into pieces. But knowing Kasapa, I say I know, and seeing I see, and therefore Kasapa should train yourself thus. Um, so it gives him three short teachings. Um, he instructs him that I will arouse a keen sense of shame and fear of wrongdoing towards elder monks, newly ordained monks, and those of middle status. Thus should, thus should you train yourself. And you should train yourself thus, whenever I listen to any Dhamma connected with the wholesome, I will listen to it with eager ears, attending to it as a matter of vital concern, applying my whole mind to it. And the third instruction that he gives to him is, I will, nem I will never relinquish mindfulness directed to the body, associated with joy. Thus should you train yourself. Later, they, um, they travel onwards together and the, the Buddha walks away from the road and sits down under a tree. And then when Rama Kasapa folds his robe um, as a to make place for the make a place for the Buddha, um, it can sit on a soft um, seat. And he says, "May the Blessed One sit down here, and this will lead to his welfare for the happiness and for his wealth and happiness for a long time." And then the Buddha sits down on his robe and says, "Your outer robe of patches is soft, Kasapa." Then, and then when Kasapa responds. May the Blessed One accept my outer robe of patches, out of compassion. And the Buddha says to him, Then will you wear my, then will you wear my old one or hempen rag robes? Yes, I will, Venerable Sir. And so the Buddha offers him his robe, and um, yeah, they exchange, the Venerable Makasapa and the Buddha exchange robes. Yeah, this is a symbol that the Buddha, in this way, symbolically asks him to undertake the Tutanga practices, the austere practices, on the one hand, and on the other hand, they are giving the robe to Venerable Mahakasapa. The Buddha emphasizes that he will be the most eminent monk after the Buddha's final Nibbana. And yeah, the Buddha has the capability to see how beings are born and pass away according to their karma. So probably he was able to see the maximum lifespan that his disciples have. And probably he knew already that Venerable Sariputta and Venerable Mahamogalana will pass away before him. Yeah, so he gives Venerable Mahakasapa the special honor of exchanging ropes with him. Yeah, then later he realizes the goal of the holy life after only eight days, which shows another time his outstanding qualities. So only eight days of Dhamma practice for final knowledge. As I mentioned, 
Venerable Mark Kassapa was foremost in aesthetic practices in Pali called Dodanga practices in Thai Tudong. And so sometimes when monks would undertake some of these practices for some time, they would say in English they go on Tudong or in Thai by Tudong. <laughs> and you all probably heard the words forest monk or forest tradition. And so if a monk is practicing at least some of these ascetic practices, then he's a forest monk. And if an ordination lineage or a larger group of monks observes these practices, then a standard, then it's called a forest tradition. Yeah, various of these Tutanga practices are mentioned in the suttas. Later in the Visuddhimagga, there are a list of 13 of them. Yeah, some of them are also observed as standard in our own monasteries. For example, yeah, there the, are the various. The first one, the living in the forest, living in the wilderness, rather than in a village or city. And, yeah, the, and having this external seclusion and living in nature, away from people and from crowds, there's something something conducive for developing internal seclusion, the sense of samadhi, like inner peace of mind. Where the Buddha found that so important that he made it part of the gradual training of a monk to go to secluded places in nature. So yeah, it's in a way living like that. When there's less external activity and what becomes clearer is what is happening in the mind or heart. There are many monks of, who have ordained in Ajahn Chah monasteries or other forest monasteries. They spend most of their life in nature or at least away from villages and cities except when they travel or visiting parents. And if you do that, it feels just normal to, to live like that in, in nature. And living in villages or cities feels abnormal and very unattractive because your chitta, your heart or mind inclines to seclusion, to, to a quiet place. But in Buddhist countries, also in Australia, there are actually many models there is, which are in villages or cities. So it is something special. Obviously, there are different levels. Obviously, there are different levels of strictness of this practice of living in the forest not from just staying a few kilometers away from the city to living in very remote places or kuti can be a huge difference. Then a further simplification one of these practices living under a tree rather than in a lodging um, that's even more empty living under a tree with a tarp or mosquito net. Another of these practices is to have only one triple set of robes. Also simplifying one's possessions, having only one Sangati, one Uttara Sangha, one Antara Vasaka, these three sets, which for example we would usually do except having one Antra Vasaka, one lower rope for working, which can get dirty. In, in tropical countries, like say in Sri Lanka, for example, then you can even survive with just the triple set of ropes because it's a tropical country. While here, it would be too cold. <laughs> so we have extra cloth. Then 
then another one going on arms round, going into a village or city and receiving food of just the people randomly donate, rather than already know, knowing who will give you food or will someone give you food or not. Again, in, in Thailand, that's standard in many forest monasteries to go on arms round. And also in some Western monasteries like Amravati Chitaviveka, then once or twice a week, monks go on arms round. <coughs> then another one eating food only from, a, from an arms bowl rather than nicely arranged from a plate, which for example we do here. Then wearing robes out of discarded cloth or rags. At the time of the Buddha, new cloth was a quite expensive item and so monks would usually just get a discarded cloth and make ropes out of it. Um, but nowadays it's relatively cheap material, for example cotton cloth, you can just produce by machines and so it's easy to, it's a relatively low price. And so in this case, yeah, wearing rag ropes is actually more complicated than offered ropes because then you just have an extra fuss basically about making this rope and you can, one can use a normal rope anyway. So that's not practiced so much anymore, but one can still at least patch one's ropes until they are too worn out. Eating only one meal a day in one session this is actually what the Buddha recommends the monks and what he did himself. Also, also a further form of simplification. You just have this one time of eating and then it's finished until the next day. Another example, living in open air, in open space, without a shelter. Challenging their own tendency to look for external protection and can make the mind vast and immeasurable. And living on a cemetery or charnel ground is good for contemplating death and the decay of the body and for challenging one's fear. So for example, a famous Dhamma talk where Ajahn Shah goes to practice on a cremation ground and then tells the monks how he was afraid and stayed there during the night. Yeah, so this was a few examples of these ascetic practices that Venerable Mahakasapa would be foremost in. It sounds maybe like a contradiction that monks observe ascetic practices because the Buddha says he was teaching the middle way. Um, but everyone has to remember that the middle way is not a lukewarm compromise but yeah, the middle way is the path of practice that leads to the cessation of desire, aversion and delusion. So it can be different than most people would imagine. And yeah, in a way one can say this, the middle way is something radical in the original meaning of the word, going to the root and abandoning the cause of suffering. For example, most people wouldn't think that eating once a day or living under trees the middle way would be. Most people wouldn't think like that. <laughs> what the Buddha gave up is self-mortification which is trying to abandon defilements or realizing some spiritual attainments by harming the body or for example starving the body, eating too little and harming the body in other ways. So this is basically uh, something unbeneficial. While the Dutanga practices of the Buddha, these practices that I mentioned, 
they they are not for harming the body actually not for torturing oneself but for weakening defilements or making them more noticeable for example if you always eat many times a day we don't notice how we are attached to food and then for example if we eat only once a day we notice it more and um, can actually notice that there's something going on there and the main purpose of these practices is to develop contentment and few desires and seclusion and simplicity one can also undertake these practices with the wrong motivation for example trying to eat only once a day because you want to be tougher and better than the other monks or wearing a rag robe because then you feel somehow you are you're just more tough than everyone else which is obviously not the idea um, basically then one is just building up conceit um, it can be even worse if someone undertakes these practices to impress lay people for example it's showing off that one is a very impressive monk and then trying to get support by that um, Yeah, so if you think about the most ascetic monk, most ascetic disciple of the Buddha, probably most people imagine Venerable Markasapa as someone very strict or serious, maybe even a little bit grim. Um, yeah, and obviously some people who are ascetic, they are more like coarse or rough characters, but that wasn't the case with Venerable Markasapa. Maybe you will see that he was different than you imagine. And maybe you remember this first instruction that the Buddha gave Venerable Markasapa, where it tells him never to give up mindfulness of the body accompanied by joy. And this is also one of, one of his main character traits, even after his awakening. That he, yeah, if you read his Theragata verses, then you will find that the atmosphere and the mood is mostly one of joy and delight. And so the main topics are the joy and delight in seclusion and the joy and delight in living in wild nature and the beauty of wild nature and delight in meditation and then also delight and joy in the Dhamma and we are also being happy about the good qualities of other monks Yeah, just to give a little impression of the verses of Venerable Markasapa. Um, yeah, where it talks about the beauty of nature and staying in the forest. <coughs> where some are exhausted, climbing the mountain, there the awakened one's air, mindful alert, balanced by psychic power, Kasapa climbs. Returning from his arms round, climbing the peak, Kasapa meditates, with no clinging, having abandoned fear and dread. Returning from his arms round, climbing the peak, Kasapa meditates, without clinging, extinguished among those who are burning. Returning from his arms round, climbing the peak, Kasapa meditates, free from clinging, free from taints, his task done. Spread over with career garlands, these areas of this, these regions are delightful to my heart, resounding with elephants, so lovely. Those rocky mountains give me delight. The splendid hue of dark blue clouds, their streams are flowing cool and clear, covered with, indi covered with indigo parka insects, 
Those rocky mountains give me delight. Like towering peaks of dark blue clouds. Like lofty houses with gabled roofs. Resounding with elephants so lovely. Those rocky mountains give me delight. Their lovely surfaces lashed by rain. The mountains are the resorts of sages. Echoing with the cries of peacocks. Those rocky mountains give me delight. This is enough for me, desiring to meditate. Enough for me, resolute and mindful. This is enough for me, a bhikkhu, resolute, desiring, of, desiring the goal. This is enough for me, desiring dwelling at ease. A bhikkhu with a resolute mind. This is enough for me, desiring striving. A stable one of resolute mind. They are like the blue blossoms of flax, like the autumn sky covered with clouds, with flocks of many kinds of birds. Birds, those rocky mountains give me delight. No crowds of lay people visit these hills, but they are inhabited by herds of deers, with flocks of many kinds of birds. Those rocky mountains give me delight. Wide gorges are there where clear waters flow, haunted, frequented by monkeys and by deers. Covered with, wet, covered with wet carpets of moss. Those rocky mountains give me delight. The music of a five-piece ensemble can never give me so much delight as I derive with one-pointed minds when I gain proper insight into the Dhamma. Yeah, so Marcus, Venerable Marcus Upper Dwelling, one can see it's not, he's not dwelling in the forest because he wants to torture himself, but actually because it's very uplifting for him. That it's, um, it's a quiet place and it's beautiful and peaceful and that inclines the mind for becoming peaceful as well and yeah, inclines the mind towards simplicity. Yeah, these verses of seen amongst the nuns are also the first example of wilderness poetry. Poetry that describes the beauty of wild nature, which was something unusual, because at that time wild nature would be considered a fearful place where people wouldn't want to go. And yeah, there's actually more to delighting in nature than just enjoying beautiful sense impressions. The Buddha describes that one can develop the perception of the forest, the Aranya Sanya, and he describes it as a first step into emptiness, um, sundata of the mind. And so basically, that if you, let's say you notice that this, if you're walking in the forest, that there's not no disturbance by people and by the usual busyness, and there's just a forest. And so in this way, the mind can become simpler and can become calmer. And then gradually, based on that, of calming the mind, Yeah, another interesting thing is to compare Venerable Marcasapa's verses with the Theragata verses of the monk after him in the, in the Theragata collection, Venerable Thalaputta. And you ever notice there's a very strong contrast between the verses of these two monks? And Venerable Marcasapa's verses have this like, more like, joyful mood, while the verses of Venerable Thalaputta are very different different mood. They're more like a, say like a battle song to encourage himself to fight the defilements. And the mood is very serious and determined. 
but before he ordained Venerable Tyler Putta was an actor. He was the leader of a group of actors and he was a cheerful character, entertaining people. And so it's interesting to consider that that yeah, Venerable Marcasapa, who was very determined and serious, became an arahant by developing wholesome joy. While the cheerful, funny actor became an arahant by getting very serious and determined. So, yeah, it can show us that we might have to develop qualities that are different, different than the ones that we already have to progress on a Dharma practice. That they, yeah, basically they both developed qualities which are very different from the original character. And if you imagine like the, the actor, was sort of an entertainer, and then it gets very serious. And when we make a supper, the serious ascetic develops wholesome joy. And uh, so, for that interesting contrast. Venerable Mark Hassapa is also the quality of mudita, sympathetic joy. When he was going on arms rounds, he didn't think, may they give me excellent things, or may they give me a lot. And his, but he thought, may those who want to make merit, make merit. May those who want to do something good, do something good. So he just sort of has mudita for people doing something good. And um, the Buddha says he's as happy if other people gain something. He's as happy if other people gain something as if he would get even as happy. How can I say? If other people gain something, he's just as happy for them as, he, as if he would get it himself. So, yeah. So having this quality of mudita, just being happy seeing people doing good actions. And also, in terms of his Dhamma teaching, the Buddha praises him for his motivation of teaching the Dhamma, that he teaches out of compassion and not by any other um, motives which wouldn't be so beneficial. So he says, um, Kasapa teaches the Dhamma to others with the thought, the Dhamma is well expounded by the Blessed One, directly visible, immediate, inviting one to come and see, applicable to be personally experienced by the wise. Oh, may they listen to the Dhamma from me. Having listened, may they understand the Dhamma. Having understood, may they practice accordingly. Thus he teaches the Dhamma to others because of the intrinsic, in, intrinsic excellence of the Dhamma. He teaches the Dhamma to, the, to others from compassion and sympathy, out of, out of tender concern. In this way he teaches the Dhamma pure. So having this motivation of compassion and kindness to, towards others. As for example, for example, not teaching to get personal disciples in the sense of that the people like him especially or um, honor him or have confidence in him especially or trying to get material rewards because of the teaching. The reason why Venerable Markasapa is sometimes described as strict or stern is that one of his qualities was that he would sometimes point out faults or defilements to people in order to help them to abandon them. There, if you remember, 
to be receptive to admonishment or to being taught is also something that the Buddha was teaching when Brahma Kasapa as first teaching actually that you should have a keen sense of shame towards even towards new monks or monks of middle seniority and so basically taking it serious if other monks tell him that he's doing something wrong or something inappropriate And so he also says in his verses, one with no respect for his fellows in, his, in their holy life is as far from the two Dhamma as the earth from the sky. But those who have a sense of shame and fear of wrongdoing are right, always rightly established. They have flourished in the holy life. For them there is no further becoming. So the Buddha even actively encourages Venerable Makassapa to teach the monks He's actually reluctant sometimes. He, he says the monks are difficult to teach because they have not so good qualities sometimes. So, I have a nice example here. Yes, it's exhort the monks, Kasapa, give them a Dhamma talk. Either I should exhort the monks or you should exhort them. Either I should give them a Dhamma talk or you should. And then when my Kasapa says, the monks are difficult to admonish now and they have qualities which make them difficult to teach. So yeah, it's not was when my Kasapa strict or stern. Um, can maybe a great disciple like Venerable Sariputta would have described him like this. It's a nice description. Should, should someone find a wise person who, like a revealer of a treasure, points out faults and reproves, let one associate with such a wise one. It will be better, not worse for him. Who associates with such a one? Let him advise, instruct, and dissuade one from evil. He will be truly pleasing to the good and displeasing to the bad. <laughs> so yeah, if one would associate with someone like Venerable Mark Kasapa and take it serious what he says, then one would get only better and not worse. So the human beings, yeah, sometimes because of his pointing out of defilements, Venerable Mahakasapa was not always popular with all human beings, but the devas certainly, certainly loved them and worshipped him. And there are two um, stories in the Udanas where several hundred devas would come to visit Venerable Mahakasapa, wanted to offer him some food. But he sends them away and he rather goes on arms rounds where some poor people are living to give them the opportunity to, good, to, act, to do good actions and to accumulate merit. And then Venerable Mark Kassapa was not interested anymore to get excellent offerings um, from wealthy people, but he just yeah, was looking for an opportunity to help others. Even though he was from a very rich, high caste Brahmin family, he would still just go on arms round in in areas of the village or cities where 
were just poor people. However, Saka, the king of the Tavatingsa Devas, and his wife, Sujata, they just sneak in anyway. They just assume the form of some poor weavers and then succeed in giving him arms food anyway, so um, they can manage yeah, somehow. <laughs> Yeah, the Buddha praises Venerable Makasapa in various occasions. For example, he says, Kasapa is a forest dweller himself and speaks in praise of forest dwelling. He is an arms food eater himself and speaks in praise of eating arms food. He is a rag robe wearer himself and speaks in praise of wearing rag robes. He is a triple robe wearer himself and speaks in praise of wearing triple robes. He has few wishes himself and speaks in praise of fewness of wishes. He is content himself and speaks in praise of contentment. He is secluded himself and speaks in praise of seclusion. He is aloof from society himself and speaks in praise of aloofness from society. He is energetic himself and speaks in praise of arousing energy. He has attained virtue himself and speaks in praise of attaining virtue. He has attained samadhi himself and speaks in praise of attainment of samadhi. He has attained wisdom himself and speaks in praise of attainment of wisdom. He has attained liberation himself and speaks in praise of attainment of liberation. He has attained the knowledge and vision of liberation himself and speaks in praise of attainment of knowledge and liberation. And also on various occasions he Tells the monks that they should emulate Venerable Mahakasapa's example and sort of become like him, similar like him. He, and he then often says, I exhort you based on the example of Kasapa or someone who is similar like him in various occasions. Then also something special. The Buddha says that Venerable Mahakasapa is equal to him with regards to most spiritual attainments. So he says, once he praises him, for example, the Buddha says, to whatever extent, to whatever extent I wish, secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, I dwell and enter in the first jhana, which is accompanied by thought and examination, with rapture and happiness born from seclusion. Kasapa too, to whatever extent he wishes, secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, enters and dwells in the first jhana. And so on. So he... Um, Yeah, in this way, that the Buddha praises Madame Mahakasapa as the kind of Arahant who is most similar to a Samasam Buddha, who has developed all four jhanas, the four formless attainments, the cessation of perception and feeling, and all higher knowledges, or different various psychic powers, that Madame Mahakasapa is equal to him with regard to that. And so it's obviously very extremely rare that the Buddha would praise someone like that as equal to him, because not often. The Venerable Sariputta and Venerable Mahabhagalana and Venerable Ananda were helping the Buddha by teaching and managing the Sangha. Venerable Mahakasapa was mostly living secluded and aloof from society. 
Sometimes he would still teach monks. But yeah, the Buddha would still value him as so important that he encouraged him on various occasions to teach and um, say it's like either he himself, the Buddha, would teach the monks or Kasapa should teach the monks. Again, I think preparing the Sangha, the other monks, that he will be the most senior monk after the Buddha's final Libana. The Buddha is also warning Venerable Markasapa to protect the Dhamma and the way of practice, telling him that otherwise things that were never taught by the Buddha will, will be propagated as his teaching. So he already basically indirectly or quite directly actually encourages him to make sure that the Dhamma and the Vinaya stay intact and passed on to, to future generations after he passes away and then he, that he basically takes charge of that. Yeah, so soon after the Buddha's final Libana, Venerable Markasapa takes the initiative to convey the first Buddhist council to recite the Dhamma and Vinaya together as, as long as there are still many Arahants and only a few monks who, are, who have wrong views or who are, are corrupt yeah, so that the Dhamma and Vinaya can be preserved for future generations. And the Buddha himself said that the Dhamma and Vinaya should be our teacher after he passed away. And so from that perspective, it was essential then that the monks would sort of compile and collect our transmission of Dhamma and Vinaya for the future generations, because that would be then the teacher for everything that follows. And often people think that the task of the First Council was trying to remember what the Buddha was teaching, but that the discourses of the Buddha were already memorized and recited and repeated for 45 years while the Buddha was still alive. And um, monks specialized in memorizing the Dhamma and the Vinaya. And so the main question of the Council was how much of all that which has been memorized should be included and what exactly would be the most important things and how can it be preserved so that an average monk can memorize it who is not a great, great arahant yeah, so after Venerable Markasapa initiates the council the monks invite him to select the participants of the council and he selects 500 arahants and suggests that the council will take place near Rajagaha because there are many lodgings and it was one of the largest cities at the time. Yeah, and so you can imagine Venerable Markasapa leading the council. At the time he was a about 90 year old monk and wearing this old rag robe that the Buddha was wearing when he attains the unsurpassable supreme awakening and uh, possessing the highest qualities of a monk inspiring confidence and respect as Arahant most similar to the Buddha who has developed the entire range of Samadhi attainments and all six higher knowledges just like the Buddha himself and Venerable Ananda the Arahants who had heard more discourses of the Buddha than anyone else. The disciple with the best memory and mindfulness in an entire eon, reciting the five Nikayas. 
Das ist so der Bedacker. And when we're party, the foremost winner expert reciting the winner. Also interesting to notice about the first council how Venerable Mark Hassaba keeps himself out of the picture, more or less. What I mean by that is, as leader of the first council, he could inclu have included lots of information about himself or about his own teachings. And well, instead of that, he just was devoted to preserve the teaching of the Buddha. About 90, I think about 90 percent of the Sutta Pitaka of the discourses are from the Buddha himself. And also the remaining discourses of great disciples. Also there he doesn't appear much. There's just one small collection in the Sanguttara Nikaya of certain discourses, a few in the Anguttara Nikaya, and then just 40 verses in the Tarakata, and that's all. And instead he gives all the prominence to the disciple who was even greater than he himself, the Dhamma general, Venemasari Buddha, who was the foremost in wisdom and also exceeded in the analytical knowledges, who was a brilliant speaker. So most of the discourses of the disciples that were included actually from Venemasari Sariputta rather than Venerable Mark Hassaba, even though he was the leader of the council. Then a way the, the great work that Venerable Mark Hassaba accomplished was to set up two conditions that would reinforce each other so that the Dhamma would last a long time. The first one, that by conveying this first council, the true Dhamma got preserved and transmitted to future generations so that monks could see what is the teaching of the Buddha and the monastic discipline. And then the second condition, by his life and his way of practice, Venerable Markasapa set up a powerful example for future generation of monks that they could emulate. And these two conditions uh, that basically reinforcing each other. So basically whenever the monastic order and the practice of the monks declined, then that some monks would read the discourses of the Buddha and then some of them would see, oh, actually what we are doing is not really what the Buddha was teaching. And then they would see the example of Venerable Mahakasapa and think this is actually how one should practice. And this is how the great disciples of the Buddha would practice. And then they would do that and some of them would realize the Dhamma and then they were again able to teach others. And so in this way, um, yeah, this, this process or the transmission of the Dhamma and the practice could continue. Yeah, the last time this happened was 120 years ago in Thailand with Ajahn Sao and Ajahn Man who founded the Thai Forest tradition by following Ajahn, by following Venerable Mark Hassaba's example and his way of practice. And yeah, that's exactly what Venerable Mark Hassaba intended. And that it was one of the reasons why he was living like that in seclusion. It was not because he was like avoiding people or maybe aversive or um, overwhelmed by contact, but he had a very specific purpose to why he would stay in seclusion. And when, when the Ramar Kassab is already older than the Buddha, says to him, you are old now, Kasapa, and those worn-out hempen rag robes must be burdensome for you. 
therefore you should wear robes offered by householders, accept meal invitations and dwell close to me. And then he says, for a long time, Venerable Sir, I have been a forest dweller and have spoken in praise of forest dwelling and of all these other practices. And then the Buddha asks him, but what benefits do you see um, that you do undertake these practices? And then he says he considers two benefits. He has a pleasant dwelling in this life, so it's pleasant for him to just be in a quiet place and not have much um, possessions and living a simple dwelling. And then also the second benefit is that he says, I have compassion for later generation, generations. And he thinks, may those of later generations follow my example. For when they hear the enlightened, the enlightened, the enlightened disciples of the Buddha were for a long time forest dwellers and spoke in praise of forest dwelling. They were for a long time arms food eaters and spoke in praise of eating arms food. They were for a long time rag robe wearers and spoke in praise of wearing rag robes. They were for a long time triple robe users and have spoken in praise of using only three robes. They had for a long time few wishes and spoke in praise of having few wishes. They were long time content and have spoken in praise of contentment. The great disciples of the Buddha have long been secluded and spoken in praise of seclusion. And they were aloof from society and have spoken in praise of aloofness from society. And the enlightened disciples of the Buddha have long time been energetic and have spoken in praise of arousing energy. And then they will practice accordingly. And that will lead to their welfare and happiness for a long time. So basically, he's, he, the reason why he was dwelling in the forest and practicing this was because it was pleasant for himself. He's just with someone who yeah, was liberated already, then it's just pleasant to just stay in a simple dwelling or at the, under a tree or just eat whatever food one gets. Just the most simple thing, and so it's most peaceful. But then the other reason was that then thinking about later generations, they will follow him, his example, and then they will practice like this, and that will lead for the benefit and happiness for a long time. Yeah, and so with this motivation, Venerable Makassapa became the great founding father of all forest traditions in Buddhist history. We yeah, inspired generation of forest monks through the centuries. Just read maybe his last four verses um, from the Tathagata. As far as this Buddha field extends, except for the great sage himself, I am the one foremost in ascetic qualities. One my equal cannot be found. The teacher has been served by me. The teaching of the Buddha has been done. The heavy burden has been put down. The guide to further becoming uprooted. Neither to rope, nor to dwelling, nor to food does he cling. Gotama the immeasurable. Like a lotus unspotted by water, inclining to, rens inclining to, rens inclining to renunciation. Detached from the three planes of becoming. He, the great sage, as the foundations of mindfulness as his neck, confidence as his hands, and wisdom as his head. Having great knowledge, he goes about, always liberated. Yeah, this was my homage to Venerable Mark the 
greatest forest monk of all times. And for Ajahn Chah's anniversary, 